Hey everyone, welcome back. In the last video, we started talking about what propositions are and give a few examples of propositions. This time, we're actually going to start doing things with those propositions. Before that, I want to start talking about operations and operators. An operation is a process that takes at least one object and transforms that object or objects in some way. And operators describe what operations are performed. Now, you've actually seen operations and operators before, specifically, when talking about numbers. So the operators that you will have been familiar with are called the numerical operators. So that's going to be things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus, and so on. As an example, we can take, say, 3 plus 5. So we're looking at the operation of addition which takes 3 and 5 and transforms them by adding their values together. In this case, we get 3 plus 5 is 8. You can also do something like 4.7 minus 3. This is the subtraction operation. And the result of that is another number with the value 1.7. So what we're doing with numerical operators is we are taking in at least one number if not more than one number, and our output is another number. So an example of a numerical operator that actually uses one number is the negation symbol. So negative negative 3 is going to give us a number with the value positive 3. So when we're talking about numbers, we can also look at variables. So I can say something like x plus 13. So we know that we're doing an addition operation on 13 and some value x. We don't know what exactly x is yet, but we still know that whatever x happens to be, whenever we give x a value, the result of this statement will be a number with the value of x plus 13. So we're taking x's value, we're adding another 13 to that, and that's going to be the result of the statement when, whenever we find a value for x. And similarly, we can have uh, statements with only variables, so something like x plus y. And we know that whenever we find values for x and y, we're able to figure out what the statement will end up being in terms of those values. And working with variables is really important. As you saw when you started doing algebra, we were able to work with a lot of statements without needing to know the actual values of, say, x or y or anything like that. And because of that, we get these, we get to draw powerful relationships in sort of the statements that we're making without needing to concern ourselves to the values of x and y. So if we're looking at, say, 2x plus 3, just looking at this and looking at all the possible values of the output of the statement for every possible value of x is going to be a lot more powerful than trying to plug in every single value of x. For example, if you're looking at x and the natural numbers, you'd be having to manually do 2 times 0 plus 3, 2 times 1 plus 3, 2 times 2 plus 3, and so on. But if we just look at 2x plus 3 here, we know that this is a linear relationship between x and the output. And all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of times where it's useful for us to talk about variables when we're working with, uh, in this case, numerical statements. So this actually ties into our topic today, which is propositional logic, or logic using propositions. What I mean by this definition is really, this is just all the types of reasoning we can look at using propositions and operators that we can do on propositions. So a little bit more on that later. I want to start off our discussion on propositional logic by talking about propositional variables. So I say that propositional variables are basically placeholders for some proposition, just, how, just like how when we talk about numerical variables, this x here is a placeholder for some number. So while we don't know the exact outcome of adding x and 13 together until we actually get a value for x, we can still consider this a placeholder and we know that, okay, well, this will be a number as soon as we can put in a number for x. 
And similarly, we'll be using letters like P, Q, R, and so on and so on for our propositional variables. And these will just be placeholders for propositions that we'll be able to then insert actual propositions into whenever we feel like. So when we combine propositions together using logical operators, which propositions we do actually have operators just the same as numbers have operators, we combine propositions using logical operators, we end up with what's called a compound proposition. And in contrast to a compound proposition, we say that a proposition that is not compound is called an atomic proposition. So for example, Iris is hungry is an example of an atomic proposition because it just exists by itself. It's not the result of combining multiple propositions, propositions together. So throughout the course of this video, we will be talking about operators that we can use to create compound propositions from both from atomic propositions and from other compound propositions. So our first operation that we'll talk about is actually an operation on only one proposition. So if we let P be some proposition, we say that the negation of P is the statement, it is not the case that P. So the way we write that out symbolically is we draw a little bit of a sideways L looking type of shape, and then we draw P after. So this basically means not P, or in this case, it is not the case that P. So saying not, Iris is hungry, which Iris is hungry, we're going to say is a true statement because I'm pretty hungry all the time. This is equivalent to saying it is not the case that Iris is hungry. That then is equivalent to saying Iris is not hungry, which I can assure you all that this is false. So the nice thing about working with propositional variables is that we can actually look at generalizations of what the negation operation is actually doing given some arbitrary proposition. And then once we do that, then we can take any proposition that we know the truth or true or false value for and then apply the negation very easily. So we'll do this using a truth table, which shows the value of a compound proposition based on its components, the components that make up that compound proposition. So in this case, what we do, and I know a lot of you have seen truth tables before, so I'll try to keep the explanation pretty quick. So what we have on this side, on the left side is the components that make up our compound proposition. And on this side of the big long bar, we have the compound proposition itself. So in this case, the negation of P only needs one proposition in order to for us to calculate a value. So we put the component here, and we list out all possible truth values of that component. So P will either be a true proposition or a false proposition. And as we discussed before, there is really no other value that a proposition can have. It can't be both true or false. It can't be neither true or false. So right now, P is only going to be true or false. So then the negation of P, what we need to do is we need to show that, well, if in the case that P is a true proposition, the negation of P is going to say that it is not the case that this true thing, it's going to claim that the true thing is actually not true, which in itself is not true. So the negation of P will end up being false. Now, in the case where P is false, the negation of P is going to claim, okay, well, it is not the case that P is true, which in this case, P is false. So it is indeed not the case that P is true. So the negation of P will end up being a true statement. So for example, we can take a look at our set S equals one, two, 
3 that we talked about in previous videos. If P is the proposition 1 is an element of S, then what we have is that we're, we're in the case where P is a true proposition. So when we look at not P, that's going to be the statement, it is not the case that 1 is an element of S, which is equivalent to saying 1 is not an element of S. And we can refer to the truth table here and say, OK, well, this is going to be a false statement. So now we're going to look at a logical operator that actually works on two propositions. So we'll let P and Q be our arbitrary pro propositions this time. We'll say that the conjunction of P and Q is the statement, it is the case that P and Q are true. So we're saying that both P and Q are true statements. You can also simplify that to say P and Q. The way we write that out mathematically is P, and then we're going to do this sort of upward facing arrowhead like this, P and Q, just like that. So if we want to look at the truth table for this proposition, you'll see me writing out P and Q on the left side here. So since the, the conjunction of two propositions is dependent on the truth value of both of those propositions, we do actually have to look at P and Q's truth values, and we have to take every single possible combination of P's truth values and Q's truth values. So we can have that both P and Q are true. We can have that P is true and Q is false. We can have that P is false and Q is true. And finally, we can have that both P and Q are false. And a good way of writing down these truth tables so that you make sure you get every combination is you start at the rightmost component and you write down true, false, true, false. You just alternate it every single time. Then you go to the next one and you alternate it every other time. So in this case, we have true, true, false, false. And if we had a third propositional variable, what we would do is alternate it every four times. So that would be true, 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 true false, 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 and so on. So, and in order to figure out how many rows you need to write down, you need to figure out the number of possible combinations you have for n propositions. So we have n equals two propositions. We'll need two squared equals four rows. In general, for n propositions, you need to look at two combinations for proposition one times two combinations for proposition two times two combinations for proposition three times all the way out through to two combinations for proposition n, which means you have two to the n possible combinations of proposition propositional values. So you'll need two to the n rows in your table. Anyway, back to the conjecture. So if P and Q, if the conjunction of P and Q is the statement, it is the case that P and Q are true. Well, that statement is going to, is indeed going to be true if both P and Q are true. If one of them ends up not being true, then this statement is no longer valid. So all of a sudden that becomes a false statement as soon as one of P or Q becomes false. So as an example, we can take Iris is hungry, the conjunction of Iris is hungry, and it is almost time for dinner. Well, we've talked about how this is a truth statement. And this, well, when we're in quarantine, it is always almost time for dinner. So this whole conjunction is a true statement. The last operation that we'll talk about in this video is the disjunction operation. So if we let P and Q be our arbitrary propositional variables again, the disjunction of P and Q is the statement. It is the case that at least one of P or Q is true or P or Q. So what we're saying is that we have a statement that is true when at least one of these is true, but it doesn't have to mean that only one of those has to be true. We can have P or Q 
where P and Q are both true, and that's totally fine. All we, all we care about is that at least one of these propositional variables is true. And the way we write this out mathematically is we use a similar error head to what we did for conjunction, only this time it is facing down. So looking at the truth table for this, true, false, true, false, true, true, false, false. What we care about, we, we want this statement to be true when at least one of these two statements is true. So this ends up being true when both P and Q are true, true when only P is true, true when only Q is true, and false when neither of them are true. And I want to note that this is not exclusive. And what I mean by this is, is that, and what I mean by this is that I want to really focus on the fact that P or Q is true when both P and Q are true. If this was an exclusive or type of operation, shout out to all the computer engineers here who work with XOR all the time. But if this was an exclusive type of or, then this would end up being false when both P and Q are true. But what we're saying when we say P or Q is that at least one of them is true. So basically, if you want to apply this to real life, if someone asks you, do you want to eat Thai food or pizza? You can say yes, and that is a perfectly valid answer to give if you end up wanting to eat both of them. People will be confused because normally we, we imply an exclusive or when we say or, but, you know, semantically speaking, it is totally fine for you to talk about an inclusive or. Uh, unfortunately, semantics don't make for many friends, but, you know, which is more important, friends or math? You have to make that decision for yourself. So I'm going to cut the video off here. In the next video, we're going to talk about a few more useful logical operations, but these ones are a little bit more complicated. So I really wanted to set this time aside to talk about them by themselves. Uh, also, for those of you who might have seen things like and, or, and not before, which I believe should be all of you because in programming languages we have these ideas of and, or, or, or not. But these next operations that we'll talk about are ones that you might not have seen unless you've taken a class like Math 248 in the past. So in short, we have a few more operations after this video, but I want to set them aside for a new video just to give you all time to digest this video before move, having to move on to the next set of operations and to really give them the time that they deserve to talk about. So I hope you all are doing well, and I'll see you all in the next video.